Then he went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened, as he was dining in Levi's house, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Please, let's pray. O oh God, your word is necessary for us. At times it can be difficult to confront ourselves with what you show us in your holy word. But we pray that your Holy Spirit would move in us now, transforming us, changing us, making us more like Jesus by what we hear. And I pray, Lord, that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. In case you didn't realize it, there are people in this world who believe that other peoples are so evil that they don't deserve any help or any sympathy whatsoever. In fact, there are some people who think those people don't even have the right to live. And if you disagree with me or doubt it, you have not been watching what's going on in the world. The attacks in Israel are horrific, and what we are hearing about what has been done is shocking to us. And yet we cannot fall into the same terrible way of thinking that those terrorists do. We cannot allow ourselves to think that they are beyond the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark is showing us and has been showing us throughout the first chapter that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the perfect Son of Man. He is the spotless Lamb come to take away the sin of the world. And in last week's passage, Jesus proved it. He proved it when he forgave the paralyzed man's sins. And not only that, but he healed and restored his body. In doing that, he showed that he is God. He has the power of God, the authority of God to forgive sins in this world. And tonight, in our passage, verses 13 to 17 of Mark chapter 2, we are shown Jesus again demonstrating his perfect wisdom and holiness as he deals again with the doubts of some of those who hear him, the doubts of those who watch him as he ministers to God's people. This is the second cycle in a group of five accounts which show the doubts that some of the social elites had about Jesus and his ministry. And in this passage tonight, I hope we'll see that Jesus calls every kind of sinner to repent and believe the gospel. Brothers and sisters, Jesus calls you to repent and to believe the gospel. Tonight, we're going to look at this passage in two divisions. We will first look at verses 13 to 15, in which we will see that Jesus calls obvious sinners to repent. And then we'll look at verses 16 to 17, and we will see that Jesus also calls hidden sinners to repent. So Jesus calls obvious sinners, and he calls hidden sinners. And in this first section, we see that Jesus calls obvious sinners to repent. Well, the most obvious kind of sinner is the ordinary sinner, isn't it? And the ordinary sinner, that's every one of us. That's you and me and everyone. You can look at every human being and know without a doubt that that person is at the very least an ordinary sinner. So let's look at verse 13. This is what, what we are told. Then he went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. It's a fact, brothers and sisters, that whole multitude that Jesus taught was made up entirely of sinners. And Jesus did not restrict his ministry to a particular group of people or a particular kind of sinner. We will find out later in Mark that the full understanding of Jesus' teaching would not be fully grasped by everyone who hears it. 
Only those whom God has given the eyes to see and ears to hear will truly get what Jesus is preaching and teaching. But the call goes out in general to everyone, to all mankind. And like the many crowds who gathered around Jesus to hear him teach and to watch him perform God's ministry, this crowd was a mixed bag of all kinds of sinners. We know for a fact that there were at least four fishermen sinners, right? Or former fishermen sinners, I should say, because the disciples were there. And it's likely that there were a lot of farming sinners. A good deal of them were probably married sinners. Some were single sinners. There were old sinners, young sinners, all kinds of sinners gathered around Jesus every time that he would preach and teach and heal, and this time is no different. But Mark tells us that something different did happen this time, something which showed that Jesus not only called the ordinary, everyday sinners to repentance, what Jesus does shows that he even calls notorious sinners to repentance. Let's look at verses 14 and 15. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. And now it happened, as he was dining in Levi's house, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. Notorious means widely and unfavorably known, in case you were wondering. Now, we've already established that everyone's a sinner. But these kinds of sinners, notorious sinners, they're known for being especially sinful, for being especially wicked. Yet the good news here is that they are not excluded from the gospel of God. They are not excluded from the amazing reconciliation that the almighty God is bringing about through Jesus Christ. Even they can be forgiven of their horrific sins. Levi, the son of Alphaeus, was exactly such a sinner. He was a tax collector. The same account is in Matthew chapter 9 and Luke chapter 5. Luke calls him Levi, just as Mark does. But do you know what Matthew calls him? Matthew calls him Matthew. And it's long been held and is commonly held that this tax collector that Jesus called on this very account is the Matthew who wrote the gospel that shares his name. You need to know brothers and sisters, that in first century Israel, a tax collector was someone who worked for the Roman government. More precisely, he worked for the puppet government, which the Romans had established after they conquered a region. The Romans learned that the only taxes which matter are the taxes which are paid. And with such a vast empire full of very different cultures, sometimes getting the conquered people to graciously pay their taxes was a challenge. In fact, sometimes it was close to impossible. And so the Romans had developed this system. They would tax the puppet leader that they set up. In this case, it was Herod Antipas. And that puppet leader would then lease out regions of his area to different individuals. And that individual who'd become a tax collector would pay the set amount of money to the puppet leader. And that puppet leader would pay that set amount of money to Rome. And thus Rome got 100% of all the money that they were expecting to get. The individual tax collector would then go out to all the people and he would take the money that he needed, presumably to recuperate the expenses that he had uh, accrued in paying that tax. But do you know what the tax collectors were notorious for doing? They were widely and unfavorably known for not stopping once they had recovered their own expenses. In fact, they would keep going. Tax collecting was a common way for someone who was very greedy to accumulate for themselves vast sums of wealth. They were not known for stopping. They were known, notorious, for taking beyond what they had right to take. They weren't just greedy, though. A tax collector had to be vicious. They had to be violent. They had to be cold-hearted and unsympathetic. To be a successful tax collector, one had to be a very skilled and a very dedicated sinner. And everyone knew that. Everyone in their society knew that a tax collector was a sinner. And Levi wasn't just a sinning tax collector. He was a Jewish man. And so he was willingly taking advantage of his Jewish brothers and sisters, his Jewish neighbors, in the name of serving that foreign conquering power that controlled all of them. 
And he didn't do this out of love or devotion to that government. He did it because he wanted to become rich. He did it for his own personal gain. He was hated by his countrymen, hated by his brothers. He was a traitor to his race and to his people. He was a traitor who served these Gentiles who worshiped false gods. His position in his society, the society of God's people, would have been, it would have been much like that leper whom Jesus cleansed in the first chapter. But in some ways, it would have been even worse. At least the leper had some pity from his people. There was a compassion that they expressed to him. God had afflicted this man with leprosy. They would have still avoided him like the plague, but they would not have hated him in their hearts. Well, the tax collector, the tax collector would have had all those things. They would have avoided him. He would have never been in any one of their homes, and yet they would have hated him. They would have despised him. They would never, ever, ever have associated with someone like that. But that is exactly what Jesus does. He comes and he calls this notorious sinner to follow him. And what does Levi do? What does Matthew do? He does. He drops it all. He leaves it all and he follows him. And not only does he follow Jesus, but it seems that he threw quite a party. We're told that there were many other tax collectors and sinners who followed him to Levi's house and they were eating with Jesus. They were reclining with him. They were with him as though they were friends. I wonder if what you would think would have been stranger. Would it have been stranger that a holy man, an obviously holy man like Jesus, who'd shown himself holy through his teaching and his healing, would it have been stranger for a holy man like that to have called such a sinner to follow him? Or would it have been stranger that such a sinner would have actually followed him? Jesus teaches and he preaches to obvious sinners all the time during his ministry. He calls the ordinary sinners to repent and to believe in the gospel. And he even calls notorious sinners, those who are known for their sin, to repent and to believe that they too can be reconciled with God. That would have been amazing enough. If Mark stopped there, we'd have plenty to worship God for. Yet Mark goes on to record what happens next because it shows something about the other kind of sinners that Jesus is calling to repentance. And so in these last two verses, we see Jesus calling hidden sinners to repentance in verses 16 to 17. We see here that hidden sinners often have something that we could call a critical spirit. Look at verse 16. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? So let's examine a critical spirit. A critical spirit, it, it's, it's, not, it's not really easy to hide a critical spirit from everyone else. The only person it's hidden from is, is us. The only person who's whose critical spirit is in secret is the person who has the critical spirit. And these scribes and these Pharisees, they, they have a lot of guts. They had a lot of courage to allow themselves to criticize Jesus of Nazareth. And obviously they didn't have enough courage to confront him directly because they say this to his disciples. But even then, they're trying to hide their sin. They mask their criticism in an innocently sounding question, don't they? I'm sure none of us here have ever done something like that. When one has a critical spirit, they are in danger because they so often hide it from themselves by justifying it. And these men justified their critical spirit because Jesus was sharing his time and his space. He was sharing the air with those Wretched tax collectors, those, those terrible sinners, and in their hearts, because of that, they considered themselves free to criticize Jesus. Their critical spirit shows that they have an unrealistic view of themselves. They're looking down on the only man ever to live who could withstand the temptations of Satan. They're criticizing the man who had just proved himself to be the son of 
God and the Son of Man by forgiving the paralytic's sin, not just healing his body, but forgiving his sins. They are putting themselves over and above the man who commands unclean spirits, and those unclean spirits obey him. Jesus hears them, and in his answer, he reveals that their critical spirit isn't really what is most out of order in their life. What he says shows that their greater sin is that they have a self-righteous spirit. Look at that last verse, verse 17. When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Again, Jesus uses perfect logic and reasoning to highlight just how wrong these critical and self-righteous scribes and Pharisees really are. Jesus has come to save sinners, every kind of sinner. He is the doctor, he's the physician, the surgeon, which everyone needs. And so he answers their criticism by pointing out that he is doing exactly what he came to do. He is delivering unto those who need healing exactly the healing which they need. The notorious sinners need to turn away from sin and they need to embrace the Son of Man. They need to embrace Jesus Christ. They need to flee to him alone for their redemption, for their salvation. And Jesus didn't call the righteous to repent because the righteous don't need to repent. But Jesus knows, as we know, that there are none righteous, no, not one. There is not one who lives unto the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. So we see that Jesus calls every kind of sinner to repentance. He calls the ordinary sinner to repent. He calls notorious sinners to repent. He even calls the hidden sinners to repent, to turn away from their hidden sins, critical spirits, self-righteousness. Brothers and sisters, no matter who you are or what you've done, Jesus is right now calling you to repent, to turn to him. He is calling you to turn away from your sin and to trust in him to save you. And so we need to remind ourselves, brothers and sisters, that the church of Jesus Christ is entirely made up of sinners. Sinners like you and like me. And some are more obvious than others, but make no mistake, no matter how holy and pious anyone you know here at Seven Run appears, you know for a fact in your mind that they are a sinner. They desperately need Christ to save them. And so I ask you, how do you see yourself? Do you know yourself? Are you an obvious sinner? Or perhaps you think of yourself as a notorious sinner. Are your sins all out in the open for everyone to see? Or perhaps you're more of a hidden sinner. Some of us have had really shady pasts. Some of us have done a lot of things in our pre-Christian lives that we would regret, that we don't want anybody to ever find out about. There are lots of Christians that God has saved from terrible sinful lifestyles and sinful habits. I want to tell you about one of the godliest men I've ever known. He's a student at seminary, at Greenville Seminary. I met him in my first year there. He is now the pastor of an OPC church in Virginia Beach. And I got to know him and his family very, very well one year because I went down for an intensive course and the family I was gonna stay with got a nasty illness that went through their house. And so at the last second, I was either gonna have to shell out a bunch of money to stay in a hotel or someone was gonna take me in. And he took me in. And I will tell you what, it was a severe sacrifice for them. It was a family of four living in a two bedroom apartment. And their living space was also their kitchen. And yet they made the sacrifices that were necessary. It was, it was an impressive act of Christian love that really touched me. And I was so glad that they did that because I got to spend a whole lot of time with my friend. I got to be in some deep conversations with him. And once we became close, he shared with me the truth about his past. He had a past that even the tax collector would have spit on. 
without going too far into the details, and for his sake, I'm not going to share his name, but he had spent almost three full decades of his life doing things which are abhorrent even to non-Christians. He belonged to a certain community, a community which in our day is despised by everyone except the people that are in that community. He had covered his body with the wretched symbols of that community. On his chest was a massive tattoo of what is probably the most recognized and hated symbol that the world has ever known. Perhaps you're beginning to understand the community that he was a part of. He was unapologetically a part of that group. And he unapologetically hated all of the people that that group hates, that that group told him to hate. He did terrible things to those people. And eventually he got caught and he went to jail and was supposed to be in jail for what would have amounted basically the rest of his life. But by God's grace, it was there in prison that the Lord Jesus Christ called him a notorious sinner of the worst kind to turn away from sin and turn toward Jesus Christ. He gave him that faith. He worked many miracles for him. He ended up having this sentence shortened and he got out of jail. He ended up moving in the hearts of people who loved this man to donate thousands of dollars so he could get those things removed off of his body. He ended up in seminary. He ended up married to a wonderful Brazilian woman and having, at that time, it was just two kids. I think he's got even more now. God called him to turn away from everything and to follow him, and he did. And I'm always amazed at his willingness to share that past, even to show me those tattoos that were still on his body. He showed me that he truly understood and believed what it is that Jesus Christ is doing to someone. He took a big risk sharing all that God had saved him from. And many Christians might hear the things that he did in his former life and think there is no hope for someone who could do that. That person could never become a Christian. What do you think they would, they would think to themselves if they found out he was a pastor? But this is exactly what Jesus does. He calls every kind of sinner to repent. And some of you might have a past life, a pre-Christian life, in which you regret the things that you did. And you don't need to be ashamed of them any longer. The shame of the sin is nailed to the cross. God the Father does not look at you and see the hopeless sinner who can never get anything right. He looks at you and he sees a beloved child. Someone that he sent his only begotten son to the cross to die so that that person could live with him forever. Well, perhaps you don't have a notorious past. Maybe the sins in your pre-Christian life were not as widely known. Perhaps your pre-Christian life was really short. Some, some people are really blessed to be saved early on in life. And yet we know that even if you're saved at the age of five, Christ calls you to him at the age of three. It does not mean that the rest of your life is going to be lived perfectly sinless. And sometimes those sins that we have are hidden. We try to keep them out of view. Maybe that's because they're only committed alone when we're by ourselves or most often those sins are committed just in the privacy of our own thoughts and in our minds. Well, first, we need to remember something, brothers and sisters. God sees everything. God knows your mind. He knows your heart. Nothing you can do is hidden from him. And it's important that we remember this. But it's also important that each of us examines ourselves very carefully in light of what we've seen about hidden sin from this passage. And so I ask you, brothers and sisters, do you have a critical spirit? Here's some questions that I, I think might help you if you ask yourself these questions. It might help you to determine if a critical spirit is a sin that you've been hiding from yourself. 
Is nothing ever good enough for you? Do some things come close to being good enough, but then a single mistake just ruins it, and everything's terrible. Everything's gone. Everything's just worthless. Do you see every mistake that someone makes as a result of carelessness or laziness or, or a lack of effort or disrespect? Is every mistake that a person's made makes uh, in your presence, is it because of their awful sin? Ask yourself, do you hold others to an impossibly high standard? Do you hold others to a standard that's different than the one which you hold yourself to? In other words, are you allowed to make mistakes but no one else around you is? When someone points out the mistakes you've made, do you always have an answer for your mistake? Do you always have a way of going, oh, my mistake's not as bad as your mistake? Do you tell yourself it's, it's excusable, your mistake is excusable because of how much you do, how much you sacrifice, how much you fill in the blank? By God's grace, I'm still married, and my sons don't despise me yet. But I'll tell you straight up, I'm preaching to myself right now. It's not just to you. I only know those questions because I've been dealing with this for years. God has been showing me my critical spirit. And by God's grace, he does things like makes me preach through the book of Mark, and I have to come to a passage like this and be confronted with it. And it's made me uncomfortable, and I'm sorry if it's made you uncomfortable too. But by God's grace, he's helping me see that the source of my critical spirit is the same problem that the scribes and Pharisees have. It's self-righteousness. It's the lie of thinking that I'm good enough. We tell ourselves that we're really not that bad, especially in comparison to all those, those tax collectors, those homosexuals, those sinners. I'm far better than them. I'm not that bad. They're notorious. At least my sin's hidden. But brothers and sisters, self, self-righteousness kills. It kills our faith. It kills our evangelism. Perhaps unintentionally, we end up communicating to people that they need to be like us before they are made like Jesus. Self-righteousness downplays the tremendous salvation of our God. We try to sanitize our pasts. And we think, glad I'm saved now. But, you know, I I really wasn't that bad in the first place. So I'm, I'm really glad to be part of the church. I'm glad to have salvation. But, you know, things weren't that different. Self-righteousness kills our sense of connection to the church. We can't really become intimately involved in the lives of others, no matter how badly we want to, as long as we keep hiding from ourselves that we think we're better than everyone else. How do we know if we're doing that? Here's another set of questions. Another set of questions I've had to ask myself, to ponder myself. Ask yourself this. Do I give advice which no one's asked for? This can be a sign of a self-righteous spirit. Often it indicates that we think we have insight and expertise that is just, everyone needs what we've got to offer. They don't even know that they need what we have. And so we force them to take our advice because we've assumed that they need it. And then when they don't listen to the advice, do you get upset? You get angry at somebody who doesn't listen to the things you're telling them to do and they had no desire for you to tell them to do it? Ask yourself, do I feel like I need to do everything myself in order to avoid the hassle of dealing with imperfection and mistakes? In other words, is this your motto? If you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. If that's your motto, there may be self-righteousness that you're hiding from yourself. Brothers and sisters, ask yourself. Ask yourself sincerely. 
Do you expect mercy when you make a mistake? Yet you have a hard time showing mercy when someone else makes a mistake. If we're living by a double standard, we are likely thinking far too highly of ourselves and far too lowly of others. And I realize it's hard to hear some of this, but it's necessary. We must not be like the scribes and the Pharisees, limiting God's grace and mercy to only those that we approve or that we can believe could be saved. The Lord Jesus Christ calls every kind of sinner to repentance. He came to save those who are lost, lost in sin. He came to heal those who are sick, who are dying because of their sin. He has come to give true life to those who are dead in their sin. Jesus is the only answer. He's the only solution. He is the only cure. And it is in him alone that we must rest and trust. Please pray with me.